Hey, um, to whoever may need this nugget of encouragement, things will be all right. So quit your worry. I get it. The eyes can stack back against the wall, but even consider. Hey, book dragons! It is your girl Lindsay here with the Spine Bookshop. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Spine Bookcast Chronicles of a Bookshop. I have the lovely Rose Prendival with me here today. She's amazing. She's written Mistress Macintosh and the Shaw Wretch and Lady Lynn and the Mysterious Mac and a book called Blue Christmas, which I'm working on the, the, uh, the Lady Lynn book. I haven't read that one yet, but I've read the other two and they're amazing. How are you doing today, Rose? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thank you. It's been a kind of a busy week after um, being off at an author's conference last weekend. So i um, just trying to get back in the swing of things and get my house in order. <laughs> definitely understand that. My house is uh, needs to be done with laundry. That's, that's what I will be doing later. Um, the amount of laundry. I just, I don't understand how I have so much laundry when what I usually wear is leggings and t-shirts. I, you know, but somehow I have this <laughs> mountain size amount of laundry. So always. So um, let's talk about reading, shall we? All right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what was the first book that for you, like clinched your love of reading? Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, I mean, when I was a little kid, my parents would read me Winnie the Pooh over, I mean, I'd make them read it over and over and over again until I pretty much had it memorized. But the first book where I can remember having a real um, experience where I realized like this is kind of mind blowing was um, a book called How Green Was My Valley. And I oh. had picked it for my <laughs> British literature class in 11th grade. And I remember reading it and suddenly, like it's so vivid, I can remember sitting on the sofa in my parents' living room and suddenly realizing I'm not seeing the words on the page, I'm seeing this happen inside my head. Like, that's amazing. <laughs> How does that you know, even work? And so I've always had a love of reading, but that book really stuck with me as being the first time I realized like this is sort of magical that you kind of stop seeing the words in front of you and start seeing it like a movie. I do that too when I read. I, I see it play out like a movie and I can't remember what the word for that is, but apparently it is a condition of, or it's like a side effect of ADD and that kind of stuff. And I'm just like, I don't care. That is how I see it. That <laughs> I'm reading it and I'm playing it in my head. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize that that it wasn't like that for everybody. <laughs> I know. Me too. Like I, we were talking last night. I was talking with one of my authors last night about how when I read, it plays out in my head and that like when I'm thinking, I hear my internal monologue and some people don't mm -hmm. do that. And it was like, I would go insane if I couldn't hear myself think. Like, <laughs> is it just quiet up there? That would drive me crazy. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so what are you reading right now? Um, I actually just finished a book. Um, I finished reading Ann Patchett's Tom Lake for um, a book club here in town. And um, I'm kind of, I guess I would say I'm in the midst of another book. I have to look up what it's called because I started it on the plane mm -hmm. and then I had to stop because I got home and um, had to start reading Tom Lake so quickly. <laughs> and I don't remember what it was. It was a romance novel. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's called How to, How to End a Love Story. Um, it's a really, really new one. Mm -hmm. And it was great. Like, I, I hated having to put it down. It's so up my alley. It's about, like, scientists. And um, I read a ton of historical, but I've been forcing myself to read, not forcing like it's a chore, but I've been mm -hmm. choosing contemporaries recently. And so um, I'm really excited to get back to that one. I love that. Um, so you've written, okay, so we've talked about your series before because um, you mentioned historical romance. So your Mistress Macintosh and your Lady Lynn, those those books are both um, loosely historical romance, would you say? Because I mean, they they're uh, they're Scottish, right? Yes. Yeah, so they're um, they're very firmly in the historical romance genre. The subgenre would be like Highland romance. 
Mm-hmm. Um, they're set in the 1700s um, and um, in, in the Highlands. The third book in the series, which comes out in the end of July, um, departs from that a little bit. It's the same um, as from the same Scottish family, but um, she leaves the Highlands. Um, she's actually been living further north on an island, um, the Orkneys, and she leaves to um, and to go on what she thinks is a merchant ship to just go someplace warm, and it turns out to be a pirate ship. So it departs a little bit from the kind of Highland subgenre in that it's not set in the Highlands, although it's still a Scottish character. Yeah, but it's pirates, so that's an automatic win for me. I mean, exactly. I know not we're um, pirates. Yeah. No, nope, there is not. And I know that we're working on um, details for your book release party for that. So details for that will be coming. Um, so, Absolutely. how did you decide to get into the the Highland romance? Like, how did that series come to you? You know, it's a funny story. I had been. Um, I had been writing something just for fun for a friend of mine. I was feeling really, really stuck in between books. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I was kind of departing from writing um, YA and moving into uh, adult romance. Mm -hmm. And I was just writing this little thing for fun for a friend of mine. And it was loosely, yeah, I mean, it was still historical um, Highland and, it, but it was just for fun. And she said, stop what you're doing right now and write a Highland romance, a Highland historical romance. Okay. And I, I wasn't sure I could do it. Um, but I thought, well, that sounds like a fun challenge. <laughs> Let's give it a try. Sure. And the series just sort of, sort of sprung from that. And I, um, I love, um, historical romance, it's, it's definitely my primary genre. Um, I tend to read a lot of Regency era romance. And so, okay. um, my friends and I, we say this series is basically Outlander meets Bridgerton because it's not, um, it, it doesn't, um, necessarily follow all of the strictures of your typical Highland romance. It's a lot more like a Regency that happens to be set in the Highlands, although, um, the time period is certainly pre-Regency in more Georgian era. Okay, okay. So how many books are going to be in the series? Um, so I'm thinking of it as a series of nine books, but with three three sort of sub-series. So uh, okay. like three trilogies, three trilogies that make it up. So the first trilogy is now complete with Maggie and the Pirate Sign. Okay. Um, and, um, but then I, I have ideas to continue it on with some of the other characters in the books. Um, some who are just named, some who actually pop up, but, um, you know, the, the first book is about the Macintoshes and the second book kind of brings in the McKenzie's. Mm-hmm. And so once, once the, the story of these three, girls is complete um i want to do kind of a sub trilogy of the macintoshes and a sub trilogy of the mckinsey's okay okay so uh okay so i'm sorry there's going to be three books in each each section yeah yeah so it's it's like three little series making up a nine book series nine book series okay that's yeah that's okay that's what i was trying to figure out okay that's awesome so have you already started writing the next series I have not. Um, I've actually started working on um, the first book in a contemporary series, um, oh, okay. which I was planning years and years ago. I was actually planning it when my friend said, stop what you're doing and write Highland Romance. <laughs> so I was okay. planning out this long eight, I can't remember how many it is, eight or ten um, books in a contemporary series. And then I pivoted to work on the historical, but I've always wanted to get back to the contemporary. So I'm hoping to launch that series next year and then keep going with the Highland or the historical, um, the Highland historical as we go. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, um, when I, I know from the first one, (coughs) excuse me, um, I know from the first one that you've got, um, you know, your main character and, and the Shaw Ranch. And so did you do research 
on um, like this clan and all of that kind of stuff so that you can write it or did you just kind of make it up as you were going along? I do so much research. Um, the events of the book are entirely fictional, um, but I did look into the Shaw clan and the leadership of the Shaw clan and the McKinsey's, and I kind of reference some real historical characters um, and and mm-hmm. some events that happened to them. So in the, in the book, in the first book, it's alluded to that Finley Shaw's older brother, his oldest brother, um, died at the first um, Jacobite uprising, and okay. his second brother, his middle brother, um, was transported to Virginia. And that's actually factually true about what happened to um, Robert and Angus Shaw. Um, so mm. I brought that in a little bit, but they're not the major characters, and there's no like they didn't have a brother <laughs> named Finn or it's anything me. like that. I'm sorry. No worries. Both um, of us have but colds I, I, today, so we're both a little stuffy. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It's going to be the the the, um, the sickly podcast. <laughs> oh, I know, right? We're both of us stuffy. So I'm sorry. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh no, no. So I I I weave together <laughs> historical fact and then fictionalize it for the book. Okay. So what 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 kind of inspired you to start writing in general? Oh man, I don't know. I've been writing my whole entire life. I remember um, when I was a little kid, like writing little stories and, mm-hmm. and and little plays and things to present to my family. Um, my mom was a writer, and it was always my favorite thing to do in school. I would say, I, I mean, I used to do it as a hobby. I did it for fun. It was like I was the kid who was always reading and writing. I, I, I played soccer a little bit, but I, I wasn't, I wasn't the kid who was out climbing trees and swimming all the time. I was right, right. Um, sitting inside reading, <laughs> reading and writing and making up stories. And yeah, yeah, um, I totally get that. Yeah. And it was reinforced, right? Because then in school, I was told I was good at it and I got mm. good grades at it. And like, that just makes you want to do it more, right? Because someone tells you that you're pretty good at it. Um, and so I, um, I majored in creative writing and screenwriting in college and just never really stopped. I don't consider it a hobby now. Obviously, I consider it my second job, but... Um, sure. But I, I can't stop. If I try to stop, then stories just start exploding out of my brain <laughs> until I write them down. <laughs> so it's just, it's not even a choice at this point. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. Um, what would you say is the most difficult part of writing for you? Um, drafting. <laughs> drafting. I, I love... Um, I love preparing to start a new story. I love the, I love the process of creating characters and situations and figuring out what their motivations are and what drives them and what hurts them. And, um, and I, I love figuring out what their story will be. And Mm -hmm. I love taking something that I have written and turning it into something better. But uh, I, I find drafting to be, um, like pulling teeth sometimes, sitting down to a blank page and just getting it all out and letting it not be good, letting it be not good, um, letting it just get out. Because um, I find that the faster I can do it, the better. I, I am not a writer who every day I sit down and I go back and reread what I wrote the last time I sat down and then start I okay. might make myself some notes about where I want to pick up. But if I do that, it takes much longer to finish. I actually, so I draft, I write everything by hand. And oh, wow. um, sometimes really? I that makes that. it hard. <laughs> yeah, I do. It's the way my brain works. And sometimes it makes it hard because if there's, if I'm stopping and starting a lot, I can't remember, did I write this already? Did I, did I have this exact conversation already? I don't know. And I, it's harder to go back and find it than if it sure. was typed up. Um, but I just push through it because I find I finish faster and better if I just draft the whole thing out and then I go back and as I type it up, I edit it. And, um, and so I, I try to do it quickly. 
um, because I just want to get through it. I want something on the page because until it's on the page, I can't see how everything connects and where I need to make it better. So drafting is definitely the hardest part. Um, and okay. that's changed over time. I would say 20 years ago, maybe a little less, <laughs> maybe 10, 15 years ago, um, I loved drafting. I hated revision because I didn't understand how to do it. Um, okay. And I didn't leave enough space in between drafts to come mm. back to it fresh and clean. So I would just kind of pick at it and change the wording and maybe make the wording prettier, but not look at the whole story and how it's working. Mm. So I really had to learn how to revise. And now um, I actually love the process of revision a lot more than drafting. Nice. Do you um do you hear from your readers very much? Like when they read your books, do you hear feedback from them? And if you do, like what kind of stuff do they say? Oh, that's a good question. So I do occasionally. Um, sometimes it's in reviews, which technically you shouldn't read, but also as an indie author, you kind of have to sometimes so that you can find the good ones to help with marketing. Um, <laughs> But, but I I have on occasion, so sometimes people will reach out on Instagram or something and they'll just say, you know, really lovely things like, I, you know, I love this book so much. This was exactly what I needed to read in this moment. And it and I don't even know why it touched me in this way. Or mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I had an email from my website from a lovely lady um who had just read Lost Blue Christmas last Blue Christmas um, last weekend, and she said, "You know, we just we had a rainy day, and I didn't have anywhere to go, and I read the whole thing, and I loved it." Um, but I think um, a, a lot of times the feedback that I get, maybe the the most often, is that people do see the books. Um, they can tell I have a film background, I guess. They they feel like there's a really visual element to my writing that they can see it happening. Um, when that, that was maybe the most surprising feedback that I've gotten and, and uh, really pleasing to me. I'm happy that I'm happy that they feel that way. I think maybe I don't notice it as much in myself right. because it's just how I write. Sure. Um, but it it gave me some confidence because um, you know, I had one reader who said, I loved this, please write it as a movie. And mm -hmm. I hadn't really thought about doing that myself, even though I have a screenwriting background. So now I'm giving it some thought and looking at how I would, how I would do that since that does seem to be some, some common feedback. Well, if you ever cast Henry Cavill in any movie, I request <laughs> permission to be on set. I, well, I swear I won't do anything really bad to embarrass myself, but you know, me and Henry. Yeah, every, anybody <laughs> who knows me knows how I feel about Henry Cavill. So. Uh, <laughs> Noted. <laughs> do you have a favorite author yourself? Oh, man. Um, that's also changed a lot over the years. Um, mm -hmm. probably, probably most recently, I would have said uh, Melina Marchetta. I'm sorry, um, you cut out. You said maybe who? Maybe I would still say Melina Marchetta. <laughs> um, Melina Marchetta. So okay. she, um, she, Ooh. she writes in whatever genre she feels like, and I love that about her. So she has written children's books. Um, mm -hmm. I would say she probably was most famous. She wrote um, some YA books that um, were really, really well received. Uh, one of them won the Prince Award, but I, my brain is addled and it's not coming to mind. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. She, wrote a book <laughs> called, she wrote a book called Saving Francesca, which was, um, I think, my int my kind of introduction to her. And then um, she moved on and she wrote a, a, a fantasy trilogy um, okay. called the, uh, the, Lum the Chronicles of Lumitaire. Um, the first one was called Finnegan of the Rock. And I wasn't really a fantasy reader, but I would read anything she wrote. So I read it and it's, of course, it's amazing. Right. Um, and then she wrote a, then she wrote a crime novel called Tell the Truth, Shame the Devil. And I just, I love that about her. I love that she, um, she kind of like Neil, Neil Gaiman in that way, that they're not, they're not pinned into one genre or even one age group. They write the stories that come to them and inspire them. And I love that. And I would read anything she wrote. That's kind um, of how I am with Neil Gaiman. I love that you mentioned yeah. him because man, yeah. 
I he's love inspiring him. Inspiring in that way too. Yeah, I, I love Neil Gaiman. Um, he's one of my favorites. Nowadays, nowadays I mostly read romance, um, and um, I again I would read anything Melina Marchetta wrote. <laughs> um, so when, whenever her next book comes out, you know whether it's romance or not, I would be reading it. But um, but some of my favorite romance readers, I mean authors <laughs> um i, I they they tend to be the historical um kind of regency and I, I really love um this sort of movement in historical romance uh, called steminist so it's these really smart sciencey feminist you know um socially forward female protagonists uh -huh. um so i love i love elizabeth everett i love Mimi Matthews, I love, um, I'm going <laughs> to struggle to name them all. But anyway, I mean, if people follow me on Instagram, I review a lot of books on Instagram. I only review the ones that I really, really enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of those authors are, are in there for sure. Where can they follow you on Instagram? Do you mind giving out your Instagram handle so that they can follow you? No, not at all. Not at all. I'm at Rose underscore Prindeville. And on Facebook, I'm at um, Rose Prindeville Author. I, I just launched that author page, um, kind of rebranding Facebook. I'm really more figure, figuring out Facebook a little bit better. Um, so, yeah, I just kind of launched that Facebook page. Gotcha. Um, do you ever listen to audiobooks? Not terribly often, mainly because I'm a poor listener. <laughs> um, I, I when I first got into them, I realized that about myself because I would I would be like 20 minutes down the road and realize I had not been, my mind had wandered. I didn't know what was happening. But most often with audiobooks, I like um, memoir or autobiography where the okay. subject is reading it. So last year. I listened to um, Prince Harry's Spare and uh, Sam Hewen's Waypoints, and those were both really, really good. Um, okay. I enjoyed them a lot. Yeah. Um, so when you're writing a book and you kind of have an idea of a story, like how do you start? Is it the plot first or the characters? Um, and, you know, like what do, uh, what's your process for that? That's a really good question. Um, I, sometimes it's the characters. I think probably most often it's it's a character um, or a situation. With mm. Mistress Macintosh, it was literally, I want to write a Highland romance, and I want it to be about a tough woman with scoliosis. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of built everything around that. That helped me figure out who she was. So I have scoliosis. Um, I was diagnosed as a kid. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that you see in fiction all that often, right. particularly historical fiction. So I really wanted to look at um, who this character could be and could become and how that would shape her. And so I... I started with this character and, and then I was trying to figure out, you know, what, what, what would she want and, and what would her family want for her and how would that um, kind of shape her world and shape the story. And mm. I built Finn, I kind of built Finn around, around the character of Jory. So um, I, I established Jory first and then I looked at, um, what kind of character would be her perfect match and her perfect foil and mm -hmm. developed uh, him from that. Okay. Um, with the second book, I, I think, you know, I had kind of introduced Lady Lynn or her, her, it was Jory's cousin, Ellen. I introduced her in the first book. And right. so it was kind of the same kind of thing in the first book. She's this, very quiet, um, meek character. Sure. And I thought, what's the worst thing that could possibly happen to her? Oh, and, and, and it was like, it was that she would get married off to somebody that she didn't even know. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so I, I built, um, 
I built Silas kind of for her around around that. Um, okay. With Maggie, it was a little bit different because when I was trying to think of titles, uh, Mistress Macintosh and the Shaw Wretch was not the first title for that. Um, and when I was what trying was the to first think title? of titles, <laughs> the, the working title, I was trying to be a little bit scandalous at first, and the working title was just Virgins um, because both okay. characters were. And um, I was like, let's <laughs> let's situate this a little bit more because it's <laughs> not that spicy, you know. <laughs> like, let's make it a little more representative of what it is. So um, I kind of consider that trilogy my Virgins trilogy, but it's not. Um, yeah. So when I was trying to think of titles, um, you know, that kind of came to me, Mister. Um, Mistress Macintosh and the Shaw Wretch Lady uh -huh. and the Mysterious Mac. And at that point, I knew both of those stories. I didn't know what Ma Maggie's story was going to be. But the title popped into my head, Maggie and the Pirate's Son. And it never let go. And okay. so when it came time to write Maggie's story, I had no idea what the story was going to be. Sure. But I thought, all right, it, you know, it's make or break time. I either have to write a pirate story or change the title and titles are hard. And I really like that title. I even picked out the font for the books because I thought this is a really piratey looking font. <laughs> so um, I didn't want to try to come up with both a plot and a title. So I decided sure. to write a pirate story and it was the most fun I've ever had. Um, drafting I it was actually that. not a challenge. Yeah. Drafting it was, was a joy. I, it came very, very quickly. It was a short okay. first draft, but, um, but it was, it was so much fun. And, um, and it was just, it's a funny story because I just didn't want to have to think of another title. So no, 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 I totally yeah. get that. So I, I notice after I've had a couple conversations with some of my authors um, that you guys love to put your characters through just like really heartbreakingly awful situations <laughs> or stressful situations. So the reader is sitting here going, oh, my God. Like, is that a thing with writers? Do you guys just, do you guys just like doing that? Like, what is that? I don't think I set out to do it intentionally, although a lot of writing advice is um, throw everything at the character, come up with the worst possible thing just to create tension and to create drama and to create um, movement for the characters through the story. Um, but I don't I don't think I deliberately <laughs> do that. Maybe I do it innately, um, but I. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't always um, try to do that necessarily, <laughs> especially writing romance. Like I'm not writing dark romance here. I, uh, you know, I, I try to strike a middle ground, to be honest with my books. There's thing, there are themes and situations where at times I say, I think I need to tone that down or take that out because this is, that's not what I'm, you know, that's not the audience. That's not what I'm going for. But, um, but romance readers kind of run the gamut. You have readers who just want light and fluffy and, um, you know, n no, no conflict, no, um, drama. And you have readers who want the really dark, like dark night of the soul the whole way through. Uh -huh, um, uh -huh. And I, I try to strike a middle balance. I, I try to write a story where there's growth and there's change and there's overcoming trauma, but okay. I usually try to leave most of the trauma in the past. And so like, um, and by that, I mean, usually some not pleasant stuff has happened to my characters in their past, right. but they, um, they've overcome it. They are in the process of overcoming it. And so it might, it might still torment them. They still are, you know, working through the, the trauma of it, but, right. um, but it's not happening. It's not usually happening like on the page. Um, typically, um, the worst, you know, the worst of it. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I just, I try to give my characters kind of some real edginess, um, some reality, some, some, you know, things to have overcome. And well, that can influence the person that they are now. 
Well, and I love that about your characters too, because the two books that I've read from you so far, and like I said, I'm getting ready to work on the third one. Both of your female characters are very strong willed, smart, educated women. Um, you know, there's none of this, oh no, what am I going to do? <laughs> you know, both of them, yeah. both the stories have <laughs> very much been just like, okay, get, just sit down. I'm going to just be, be quiet. I got it. <laughs> which I just really, really love. And I feel like that's kind of becoming a trend with, with literature right now, these strong female characters who are just very much, no, no, I can save myself. I don't need you sit down and be quiet. And yeah, did you start out I'm, very your much, female <laughs> um, I'm very much a fan of the lady saves herself for sure. Right. Um, I, I like to give my female characters the tools they need to get themselves out of the situation that they get into. Sure. Um, I will say it's funny because both of those characters, um, there was a point in time when I was writing them where I didn't like them. And really? I had to sit down. <laughs> yeah, I had to sit down and figure out what is it I don't like about them um, and, and fix it. And okay. um, actually, so when I was answer? writing last week, well, because <laughs> I'm I was curious, I've never heard an author thing. say they didn't like their characters. <laughs> well, I like them now. Um, right. I love them now. But when when I was writing Last Blue Christmas, um, I I got to a point where I didn't like Maggie, and what I realized, I felt like she was too much like me. <laughs> And I was like, oh, that's a problem. <laughs> so I don't, I don't remember any, I don't remember anything specific. Um, I, I don't remember, I literally don't remember what it was. I didn't like her or how I fixed it. Um, okay. I, I think that um, at first she, she wasn't um, active enough. And what, do, I really what do you mean by to, active enough? She, things were happening to her instead of because of her. Okay, and okay. Gotcha. She, she wasn't making choices to move the story forward. And I think also what I did to really bring out that character and make it a character I love was um, build up the female relationships in that story. I, I think, think, yeah. Um, probably in early drafts, she was probably um, not interesting enough and she was probably just pining for everything. She was pining for the career that she had wanted and she was pining for the man that she wanted mm -hmm. and she wasn't doing anything about it. And it was just, I don't know, maybe a little too woe is me or something. Uh, and yeah. I, built up, I built up the relationship between her and her friend and I was able to just really, I love that relationship. And I, I think that gave her a lot more dimension. You can see her be flawed in that relationship, but you can also see how good she is. Um, she's a really good cop. She's a really good friend. Right. She's kind of faking it till she makes it, but she's doing a good job. Sure, and, sure, um, sure. I like to think in some ways I made her more like, the me that I didn't realize that I was, I guess, if right. that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I um, can kind of see in, what you're saying. In Mistress Macintosh, I I realized at one point, I wouldn't say that I didn't like her, but I realized at one point that I had her making stupid decisions that were out of character. <laughs> and it was, a, it was a little bit like if you watch Outlander my, or Reddit. I, I um, do. Face, I'm obsessed with that show. So, so my biggest beef with Claire, and it's fair because Claire is from the future. Claire is not from the past, but she, she, especially early on, she doesn't, she doesn't behave smart. Um, no, she doesn't. She doesn't interact with. She interacts with those men as though she expects them to react like twentieth century men, right. and they are not, right. and they don't. And it's like she never learns, and she just keeps goading them, and it's like, well, they're gonna hit you. Yes. Um, and I realized I kind of had a little bit of that going on myself in Mistress Macintosh. Sure. Jory was in certain situations where she wasn't, 
you know, I had crafted her as this woman who learned how to live in her environment. And then I put her into situations where she was reacting like a 21st century woman. <laughs> and um, <laughs> instead of the character that I had created, and I think once I realized that it was like, oh, that's that, that's like literally the annoying thing um, that annoyed me with Outlander. So I, I had to change. I mean, and I also love Outlander. That's not meant as a, that's just a flaw in Claire's character. Sure, no, no, yeah, yeah. Um, but it didn't, you know, it was not a flaw that I intended to have. And, and once I um, changed that a little bit, um, it uh-huh. worked a little bit better for me. But yeah, I do love it. No, I can much. see that now that you say that. <laughs> um, I, yeah, because I, yeah, because Claire, there's sometimes that she makes decisions the same way as, um, you know, other women do that you just kind of want to go, what, what, what are, are you doing? doing? <laughs> Yeah. What? Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. And no, so, I love you know, there's, there's situations where that's an intentional choice and you want the reader to be like, what are you doing? But um, it wasn't the choice. It wasn't the, the reaction that I was looking for from my readers. And I had to kind of realize what I had done. So. Okay. Okay. No, I mean, yeah. I totally get that. Um, so. Are you like as you're writing the next, you know, books in this series and that kind of stuff? Like, is that is that going to be something that I assume that's going to be something you're going to continue doing is um, making your female characters strong willed? And, and, and are you going to eventually have them all come together in, in one big book or is it just going to be it's this is a trilogy, this is a trilogy, this is a trilogy and none shall meet? Um. It's a good question. I think um, a lot of writing is making it up as you go along and you suddenly realize like, oh, this character works really well um, in this book. For example, um, my my new series is extremely well planned, but I was trying, I was thinking about it um, on the plane actually last week and I realized that there's crossover potential between Last Blue Christmas and the new series because of Ooh, like one okay. line. Yeah, so there's one line in, um, and it, it, I think it was my subconscious <laughs> doing this, but um, <laughs> so they, they're going to definitely take place in the same world, so it's possible characters could pop up. But um, there's one line in Last Blue Christmas where Max is thinking about his watch band and he mentions that it was made for him. It's for his grandfather's watch, but it was made for him um, by his friend and neighbor, Selena, a friend of hers who works okay. at the Renaissance, who works at the Renaissance fair. Okay. And um, in my new series, there's three characters who travel around working at the Renaissance fair. And I realized like, Oh, <laughs> that's Selena's friend who made the watch band. So there's potential for crossover um, to bring those characters back. Um, okay. In the historical, in the historical, um, I often try to bring back characters. So you've read Mistress Macintosh. Um, right. So the second book is about her cousin, Ellen. Um, characters from the first book definitely appear in the second book. Um, Okay. In the third book, the third book is a little, um, a little bit different, but um, they're definitely referenced, and it's possible some characters might show up in the epilogue. Um, okay. For the for the offshoot, like the the other six books, um, there's definitely the potential for crossover. I I don't even know what the stories are about yet. I just know who they're about, and okay. um, every single one of the characters has been mentioned in the books so um there's definitely opportunity for certain characters to go in and out throughout those okay um so i know with a lot of authors they'll do books like that and then they'll have novellas you know where this is a little story Mm -hmm. from this and this is a little story from that is that something that you're going to do or are you just going to keep it very simple with those are the nine books and that's it i I would never say never. <laughs> right. Um, I I struggle a little bit with novellas, um, but if the right story came to me, I might do it. So, for example, um, actually, someone at your store said they had they had wanted to see um, 
what happens to Jory and Finn later. And I don't want to give anything out, uh, give sure. anything away about the book, but they had wanted to see kind of this further adventure. And mm -hmm. that might be a prime opportunity for a novella. Um, it's just finding the time to write it. So right. um, I could definitely see when, you know, when the right thing comes along, maybe doing a little, I don't know what the requirements are to call something a novella, but doing maybe a, a, a really short thing. Like I did one for um, Last Blue Christmas. In right. that book, they talk a lot about um, when Max and Maggie first met or, you know, their, their first big case, this case, this mysterious case that happened 10 years ago is referenced. Sure. And so I, I wrote a little short uh, story about that case. And so okay. I could see that happening. I would just have to have the right idea. I tried forcing one. I actually, um, so there's a character, a pair of characters in Mistress Macintosh that were kind of uh, foster parents to Finn. They were sort of like his second family. Right, uh, right, Mr. right. Mrs. Yeah, and I have an idea to write a, a little story um, about them and how they get together. I just, again, I haven't, I haven't had the time to do it. So definitely, um, there's always the possibility. Um, I would definitely read another like novella of that because I just, that story I just think was so beautiful. Um, because you've got those two little kids in last week Christmas that, and their story mm -hmm. so heartbreaking and then it just not to give too much away, but it just, I remember absolutely falling in love with that story because it is such a good, good, good story. Thank you. Um, so let's see. We are almost out of time, but what is your favorite book right now? That, oh, you're, that you just like, um, if you had to pick a favorite <laughs> book that you've ever read and like you would want to see it made into a movie or something like that, what would you, what, what would you, yeah. what book would you have? <laughs> That's such a hard question. Um, so there is a book that I read a couple years ago called The Spare. So not to be confused with Prince Harry's biography. Um, okay. It's called The Spare. By Miranda Dubner. And that okay. book grabbed a hold of me and didn't let go. I think I've read it three times now. Um, I reread it when I had COVID. I read it like twice in one year. I don't reread really because I don't, I, there's so many books I want to read. But I think I've read that one three times now. Um, it's a contemporary romance between, um, so it's about a young man who is. Um, second in line to the throne. So it's kind of like an alternate history of England. Okay. Um, but so he's the second son. Um, the, the queen actually divorced the king when he was a child. And uh, he's got an older brother and a younger sister. Um, so okay. he's the spare. And, okay. um, and he is absolutely in love with his bodyguard. And um, it's, there's so much in that book. There's so much to it. Like, I don't even think I could describe it, enough, describe it well enough, but it's, it's so beautiful. And there's so much, um, internalized, like there's, it, he's a character who took so much on himself to try to hold his family together in this horribly bright limelight after his father left Okay. Um, while well, his mother is busy being the queen and, um, and the relationships between him and his mom and him and his dad and him and his siblings and him trying to always, always do the right thing and what the, um, what the institution, uh, you know, the, the, that sort of runs the monarchy, what they want him to do and what he needs to do for the media. And, and right, it's, right. it's so good. Like that is the book that I'm, I just like tell everyone that they have to read. Um, I would love to see it as a movie. I would, I would, I kind of want to read it again right now, just talking about it. But it's <laughs> so good. I, I think it was Miranda Dubner's first book. And I'm just okay. desperate for her to write more. Um, it's just, it's so good. 
Okay. Um, so, all right. So I'm, I'm going to do something new because we're almost out of time, but I want to finish out with something that I'm, I'm calling the four questions. Okay. Okay. So you have to tell me which one you prefer. Okay. Coffee okay. or tea? Tea. Movie or a book? Book. Morning person or night owl? Oh, gosh, neither. <laughs> I guess morning. <laughs> I last one. Do you prefer showers or baths? Oh, baths. Yeah, me too. Well, I want to say thank you so, so much for joining me today. It has just been an absolute privilege, and I appreciate you taking the time out to let me interrogate you and talk about your books <laughs> and you. reading. <laughs> thank you. It's been really fun. Oh, good. I'm so glad. Well, all of you guys should definitely come into the Spine Bookshop and grab her books. Um, Mistress Macintosh and the Shaw Wrench, Lady Lynn and the Mysterious Mac and Last Week Christmas. And as she gets more books, we're going to have those as well. So thank you so much, Rose Prindeville. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Hey, uh, to whoever may need this nugget of encouragement, things will be all right. So quit your word with me. The eyes can stack back against the wall, but even consider it such no you stand firm.